great thing to administer uh, external markers as we worked on and we found some problems with administering external markers, sorry. But I want to introduce a solution we're working on. Because when you're dealing with animals that sand or go up to the green pea on a voluntary basis, they don't know they have to eat a marker that day. And they will always do it the day before you're supposed to start sanding. Uh, indirect calorimetry using the green feed uh, was something I've always, always wanted. And I, I think, he, you know, I was talking to Scott about it even before we purchased one. And then um, he was gracious enough, after we purchased one, he, uh, didn't we pay for the equipment and you, at cost and you installed it all for free? Something like that. And then it took us about two years to actually get it to work. So, uh, so that's how much we work with Greenspeed on this. But doing uh, indirect calorimetry on a, in an open air environment with great, and we don't want to disrupt grazing behavior or forage intake. That was always a problem with uh, chambers and such. Uh, and then maintenance energy is the single largest expense in ruminant production. And you know that's the thing about the cow calf producer. You got those cows out there and they're just eating every day, so there's a lot of methane produced. And uh, to make your ruminants more efficient, that's how I sell it to our beef producers because they're not really interested in greenhouse gas, they're interested in efficiency. If I can show them that you have this finite rangeland that produces X amount of grass and you can get more beef off of it and still protect the environment, they're all for that. Um, indirect calorie for raising cattle is needed determine that that was going to be anything. Uh, the problem, you know, with restoration chambers, uh, I think it's been well established, the green feed estimates are similar to those, but the problem with the chamber is it's a short measurement period, you know, maybe four or five days if your eye couldn't let you go that long, and um, it's not the environment they're grazing in, so all of a sudden you're getting reductions in feed intake, you're getting uh, grazing behavior disruption, even if you put them in for a short period. Of period. So it's just not optional for grazing animals. The spot measurements um, system is what works best for us. We put ours by the watering system. Uh, you can see up here, and then about like clockwork, they will come in and, take, and sample at watering, and then they'll usually sample at least tw two more times a day even though ours is set up for four. And, um, you know, the original one came out with just methane and CO2, and then we, now there's an O2 sensor available. And so you can measure those simultaneously, just like a chamber. Um, now, this is the Brower equation. I, I hope you've all uh, seen this paper, because it took me several years to actually find a copy of it. Everybody cites it, but it's really difficult to find. It was an old proceedings paper from years and years ago. And um, actually, a, a guy who'd been in the business for 40 years finally found his copy. He said, I got one. It took him that long to find it. But uh, one of the problems here with grazing cattle is you got the urinary nitrogen, which is a very small adjustment, but that is an issue when you're doing grazing cattle, because unless you use some of the technology that measures like urine output and nitrogen concentration, um, which those machines are fairly expensive, and when you're dealing with these landscapes, I'm afraid you just don't lose them. So uh, we actually changed the system. You can move along or never move through this. And uh, we just take the, uh, the uh, nitrogen out and um, Mariana Katana from Aberdeen University did it this way, and then she adjusted up 4% for the nitrogen loss based on Van Sos' uh, book. But what we do is we, like for this, this study we're gonna look at now, we have used a Cole uh, 2020 manuscript to, and it was 6.52% increase as of urinary nitrogen. So that's how we adjust the Brower equation. So we did a, and then 
to get back to metabolizable energy intake, we just uh, it's just heat production plus retained energy. So we just calculate the uh, the retained energy based off the animal performance. So the study I'm going to show you was 77 days, and and we just based it off the gain. And there's some math down there if you really like that. Um, so to evaluate this, we took, uh, as an indirect calorimeter, we took eight crossbred steers as our first study ever, and they were used in a 77-day growing experiment. The cattle were individually fed in a, in a pen equipped with kaolin head gauge, and after two weeks of adjustment, the steers were randomly assigned to either 1.1, uh, 1.4, or 1.8, uh, times maintenance and the hay used was a long stem wheat hay that was 15% crude protein and 64% TDM and also in the diet was about one kilogram a day of the bait which was an alfalfa pellet and then of course we took body weights to do uh, new uh, energy retention and calculate heat production based on the Brouwer equation and the adjustments I suggested. And then we determined fecal output in this study to, to determine fecal energy loss, but we used indigestible ADF. And diet samples were analyzed for gross energy, so we knew how much gross energy they were consuming. And dependent variables were analyzed using SAS. Um, here's our, our intake. And you can see our body weight uh, increased with increases in maintenance. Uh, so those data look pretty good to me. Um, I got some other some. So here's our gross energy intake based off the uh, samples and uh, heat production uh, calculated from the green feed data, and if it. it looks pretty good to me uh, compared it to other the uh, gases from other studies and calculated the heat production and it falls right along one anomaly in this data and I haven't found anybody is that we didn't get an increase at the second third step in methane production uh, the a couple of reviewers on the manuscript didn't care for that very well uh, but I have no explanation I went back and checked the data the only thing I can explain is that if you increase intake from increasing maintenance, you also increase passage rate. So you might be, um, because of the curve of methane production, you might have to be emitting less per unit of intake. Um, and then we get a predicted methane in, or metabolizable energy intake of 12.6 or up to 22, and those were all linear. So that part worked pretty good. And I think this is the uh, part you guys want to see, is that with partial correlation and concordance of correlation, the, uh, there was a study published from New Hampshire years ago, you guys remember that paper? And they used uh, RQ because they didn't have an O2 sensor and it didn't work very well because I believe the fact that, um, or my conclusion was, was it didn't work well because they used an average RQ for every animal, well, no animals. Average. And but here the uh, correlation, so this was highly precise at 97%, but probably the one you're most interested in is the concordance or the uh, the uh, the accuracy of it was 81%, which is considered good. And uh, that is at least twice as good as the two papers that I know of that just did it with an RQ and did, they didn't have the O2 sensor. So if you're interested in this type of work, you really need the O2 sensor. Next thing we're going to talk about measuring fecal output, and this is actually Matt Beck's research, master's research at the station. If you don't know Matt, uh, he went to New Zealand and worked on greenhouse gases there. Now he's in Andy Cole's old job at Bushland, Texas, and he's working in greenhouse gas and feedlot cattle. But uh, the green feed, you know, can be fitted with a dual chamber system, and you, so you can have two separate feeds in it. Now, when I first got the dual chamber, I thought about using a high protein versus a corn or something. 
And then I got to thinking, well, why can't I put an external marker in one? But my experience has found is that cattle don't eat the same drops every day. They're notorious about, if you have to allocate 32 a day, they'll eat 30, or they'll eat 28, or maybe they'll eat 32. So that won't work for a marker. Or at that time, I thought it wouldn't work for a marker. So um, we have, we're working with uh, Mike at Sea Lock. We have our setup, so the first drop, when they come in the morning, they get the titanium, and the rest of the day, they just get on our feet. And uh, so, uh, and our goal was, is using the green feed to administer marker, we don't have to put in a squeeze chute every day, so we prevent disruption of grazing and we reduce our labor requirement. Okay, uh, we took uh, 12 heifers, and they were grazing native range, that was pasture land like you saw in some of the previous slides, and with six were hand-filled alfalfa pellets containing 1% titanium dioxide, and the remaining remainder receives their dose from the uh, green feed system. The cattle were acclimated to the markers for seven days, and then the fecal samples, the feces were sampled morning and evening for five days after seven days of acclimation. Uh, feces were dried and ran to pass a two millimeter screen, composited, and we analyzed it for titanium, and then fecal output was calculated as dividing the dose by the concentration of feces. Okay, here's the, the data. Um, we had, uh, I've got a mistake, there's actually six head on the um, hand fed. But, um, because one of them had unrealistic values. But the, uh, you can see here that the greenhouse gas emissions were pretty close to normal and what we'd expect in that environment. And, um, but here, you can see that the cattle were the average daily gain. You can see that based on the two-sided t-test, there is agreement between these two numbers. But the thing that we really noticed that jumped out at us was here we have a 0.7 for a standard deviation, and there we have a 0.1. That kind of bothered us. We don't like variation. Um, so we looked into that. And one of the things about hand feeding is that you know, the cattle, the six cattle got all their feed essentially at the same time. Maybe 20 minutes to go down and feed them, but pretty close to the same time. Where here, there's actually about a six hour spread when they're taking their feed. And if you can live with the variation, that's okay, but we really didn't care for that. But our conclusion is, this is the Journal of Animal Science, our conclusion was, yes, it works, but we need to do something about this variation and see if we can do that. So I went and talked to a guy named Corey Moffitt. He was at that first green feed training years and years ago. But Corey is, uh, if you're gonna argue with him about math, you better pack lunch. So he's been working on this problem because he, he sees a lot of value in this. What? Sorry. And he's been working on a multi-dosing model, and essentially here, uh, you know, he, he wrote this slide up here. He said, consistent dosing will eventually have an approximate steady state fecal marker concentration, although there's always some small oscillations. And I went back and looked at the data out of the 60s when they were using chromic oxide, and you know, they were, they were sampling up to 16 di times a day trying to get it constant. And they never did, because it always has oscillations in it. So what he thought is each dose of, in a marker concentration responds, or uh, it's a previous dose. So what his deal is, he's gonna, he wants to do a uh, multi-dose marker concentration model as the sum of multiple single G2 models. And he has done programmed this in SAS, and now I'm going to show you a little data. And he's trying to get this published by Paul. But this is our first data we ever collect, and we actually, this paper here reminds me of one of the old uh, UK papers where they actually had the names of the animals on the slide. But we got Lefty and Poncho, Splish and Reese. 
But these are some just some individual titanium excretion curves after we just gave them a single dose. And the red line was actually a lower forage intake and the black line was a higher. And as a general rule, you can see how the black line is, tends to be higher and the slope on the back side of it tends to be faster because they're consuming more forage because you have higher passage rate. What is the x-axis? Oh, this here? Well, no, that's time, but what is that to know? I can't. Oh, that's uh, parts per million? No, on the, the x axis. That's 20. Oh, seconds. time down to below? Yeah. That's time? Yeah, but is that minutes? I can't read it. That's hours. Hours, okay. Sorry. It was a low quality diet, but it's pretty slow. No, it's okay. It's just... Yeah, that's fine. But we have a model at the laboratory we use to plan um, dosing when we're doing like rare earth supplementing. And so we can actually put the parameters we believe the diet in, that, in, in there and then we can actually from that we can pick out the sampling times. Because if you're using like the G2, G1 model it's very sensitive to when the marker appears and stuff. But here we constructed what the, the black line would be the fecal titanium concentration based on the, the G2 models. So basically, like here, uh, this concentration here is the sum of this one, this one, or over here is the sum of every line down below. So he's developed a, mo a series of G2 models for, and he does every dose. So you, you'll be able to take the uh, dosing time out of the data you download from the green feed, so if they feed over here, the line will be here, and then if this one feeds over here, this line will be here, and it'll slide these uh, model responses back and forth. Or, it'll also count for one, if one is completely missing. So we ran ex another experiment, and this is the same cattle, and we did the doses just like the uh, just like uh, you saw before, except the day before we were going to start sampling, we didn't give them a dose. So here you can see how the, uh, like up here with Lefty, you can see the green dots are actually the samples we took. But, and then we didn't give the dose on the day we started sampling, and you can see that it follows the line down, and then it closely follows them all the way back up. And from that, we were able to calculate fecal output, and it agrees with what we collected in the pen. And Corey's going to try to get that published this fall. He's pretty excited that they look like that, because that's real world data, even though they look kind of messy. But I've thought about this quite a bit, and I don't know how many times we've thrown out data because something got even, regardless whether it's green feed or whatever. We've just thrown out data because one of the doses was missing. Because we didn't, well I know the technology was there, but it took somebody to point, it, point us to it, because we didn't know how to do the math. And so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, thank you for listening to me.